My name is Alan Schroeder. Uh, I am the co-chair of this COVID-19 and Children seminar series along with Dr. Rajni Matthew, uh, who will be introducing today's speaker uh, very shortly. That's Dr. Arvin. Um, upcoming sessions on October 29th, a week from today, we will be discussing uh, COVID-19 and, and how particularly the early aspects of the pandemic were managed in the primary care setting. We have a, a number of experts uh, locally uh, on that topic. And then um, on November 5th, we'll be bringing back once again, uh, Dr. Bonnie Maldonado, who will be speaking about pediatric epidemiology and transmission uh, of COVID-19. Um, you can get CME for this by uh, uh, texting the code that you see here, uh, which is also in the chat. So don't worry if you don't have it right now because Ingrid has put it in the chat. Um, and then if, let's go ahead and get um, Steve's slides up. So as we've done now for several weeks, we start each session with a five minute quick hit evidence review uh, where we try to choose an article from the uh, prior week or two that we think has had a national relevance and ideally uh, relevance to children. And uh, I am very thrilled to have Steve Montalvo, who is one of our senior residents, uh, pediatric residents, uh, presenting today some of the preliminary results from the uh, World Health Organization Solidarity Trial. Steve, um, aside from being uh, intellectually curious, is also insatiable in that he is going to complete a pediatric residency and then start a whole new residency in uh, radiation oncology at UT Southwestern next year. So Steve, appreciate uh, your willingness to step up to the plate here and excited to hear about the solidarity trial results. Thanks. Pleasure. Um, so uh, like Alan said, I'm gonna be uh, presenting one of the interim analyses of the World Health Organization solidarity trial. It was published in MedRx IV um, last week. Uh, the DOI is provided below. Um, the rationale for this trial was quite simple. Um, as the pandemic ramped up, uh, a uh, expert panel um, came up with a few target antivirals um, that might be efficacious uh, against COVID-19. Of these, uh, remdesivir was uh, chosen as a potential therapeutic. Uh, in response to the WHO began a large, simple, open-label, randomized trial in 30 different countries at 405 hospitals, uh, testing each of these four uh, therapeutics. Uh, this interim analysis uh, was predetermined by committee at certain dates, uh, given the unknown effect of these um, medications. Um, so uh, this is obviously important because remdesivir uh, has previously had a positive signal uh, in the ACTT1 uh, study. There was uh, improvement in time to uh, recovery um, with patients taking remdesivir. Uh, our own president uh, was treated with remdesivir and this generated a lot of press uh, in the popular uh, space. And then uh, the New York Times um, reported on uh, uh, the WHO trial um, showing that remdesivir uh, uh, has maybe not as big of a signal as we were hoping. Uh, this trial was an open label, randomized, non placebo controlled trial that uh, was analyzed as intention to treat. It um, consisted of uh, randomization of patients um, by physicians uh, at their hospitals uh, uh, between the available drugs in uh, the certain area. Uh, this was a worldwide uh, trial, so you can imagine some medications were not available in certain parts of the world. Um, however, everything was uh, 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 randomized to a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, balance. Remdesivir was given as a 200 milligram loading dose on day zero and then 100 milligrams thereafter. Uh, the primary outcome was in hospital mortality at 28 days, follow-up ceased at discharge. Uh, and then secondary outcomes were time of, uh, or rather uh, transition to ventilation or uh, hospitalization duration. The eligibility criteria are listed below. Uh, 11, over 11,000 patients were enrolled. Um, most patients were available for intention to treat analysis and uh, 2,700 uh, uh, received remdesivir. Patient characteristics uh, were notable for a, a, a quite elderly population. So more than, uh, or rather 64% were uh, older than 50. Uh, the paper reported um, three boxes, less than 50, 50 to 69 and greater than 70. Most patients were male. Uh, most patients required some form of oxygen, oxygenation or ventilation. However, a minority of patients were actually ventilated 
uh, at initiation of the, of the study, 8%. Uh, most patients were from a uh, composite Asia and Africa uh, group um, that included, I think, mostly uh, 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 the Middle East. Uh, and this patient uh, population suffered a, a quite a high mortality of 11.8% uh, at 28 days. Uh, and notably of the control group matched with remdesivir, only 1.6% of them received remdesivir. The Kaplan-Meier curve is provided. It shows no difference between uh, the control group and remdesivir group, uh, uh, signifying no improvement in mortality in patients receiving remdesivir. Uh, a forest plot looking at some of the, the demographic data that was captured by this uh, study showed no benefit um, if stratified by age, uh, uh, nor uh, initial respiratory support. Um, in fact, potentially worse outcomes in patients who are ventilated, though, of course, this was a non-significant uh, um, uh, uh, event. This trial raises some concerns. Uh, I, it's a very crude trial. Um, it was randomized, um, but uh, open label. And so physicians and patients knew what drugs they were getting. There was no placebo. Um, the endpoint was mortality, however, uh, hard to fake that. Um, however, uh, follow-up was lost uh, after discharge. So we have no idea if patients went home and, and expired at home um, after you know, being discharged from the hospital. There's a paucity of demographic data uh, that was not captured by this uh, trial. Um, and uh, notably, no standard of care was defined across these uh, many different hospitals in many different countries. I think the one standard of care that has been uh, well described is corticosteroids, and only about half the population uh, received those, as you can see in the, in the table on the right. Uh, and then, of course, one uh, would uh, be concerned about a selection bias, either self-selection of patients wanting to enroll in the trial um, or uh, physicians enrolling sicker patients. This trial was important because it was a large trial, it was worldwide, and it showed negative results, certainly suggesting that uh, remdesivir is no silver bullet um, without good supportive care. Uh, uh, questionable, though, how generalizable is this data when you do have good supportive care uh, and whether there is a signal um, uh, within a subgroup um, uh, that might benefit from uh, remdesivir. And then notably, very high mortality in this population that we aren't seeing in the United States. So interesting trial so far. Thank you, Steve. Very nice synthesis. Um, you can unshare your screen. Um, and we, I hope at the end of today's session, I think we're gonna have a fair amount of time for Q&A so we can talk uh, about antivirals in general with Dr. Arvin, but I'm gonna pass it to Dr. Matthew now to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Alan. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Anne Arvin. Her accomplishments are obviously too long for us to describe right now, but I'm going to do a brief introduction. Uh, she's a professor of pediatrics, infectious disease, and professor of microbiology and immunology at Stanford. Uh, she served as the chief of pediatric infectious disease at Stanford from 1984 to 2006, and thereafter went on to be the vice provost and dean of research from 2006 to 2018 at Stanford University. Her research has primarily been on molecular mechanisms of varicella zoster virus infection and immune responses to the virus. Her extensive experience studying the ins and outs of viruses and being an infectious disease physician just makes her an apt choice for today's discussion. And so welcome, Anne, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, it's yes. a pleasure to be here. I've been asked to talk about the basic virology of SARS-CoV-2. And that means starting with the structure uh, of the virus and the viral genome. So this picture uh, or ones like it certainly are very familiar to everyone. Um, let me just get a better pointer here. Um, we um, know very well the spike protein, which is the entry protein. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But I think it's good to look at the whole virus particle. This is about a 100 nanometer object. And I suppose in the world today, there are billions of these viruses um, 
uh, showing um, how incredible uh, this little machine um, can operate. So we see within the envelope, which is the outer part, we see the squiggles, which are the um, genome, uh, the viral genome. And we see in addition to the spike protein, the membrane protein, envelope protein um, uh, expressed as part of each particle. How does this translate to the genome? What we know about this virus and which we learned very quickly um, is that it's about uh, 30,000 um, base pairs. It is an RNA genome, a single stranded RNA genome. You can think about this as, uh, as really the same as a messenger RNA molecule in a host cell. So the virus comes in with this genome, it's ready to start lining up um, the um, uh, amino acids that will um, result in production of the proteins that we know. Um, we know from this structure what, what a number of them are, which are the so-called structural proteins, including the spike protein. But what the virus really needs to get started is what are called the non-structural proteins. And these are proteins that create the replication complex. So the, the structure of the um, within the cell where the virus sets up shop to make more RNA genomes and um, process um, those, those genomes, packaging them into uh, a new virus. So the um, process is very efficient and um, uh, results in many virions per cell. We'll come back to that in a minute. I thought another interesting point to make about the genetics of this virus is we've been deeply interested, of course, in where it came from. So I'll give you this background on the animal reservoirs and the intermediate hosts of both the emerging coronaviruses, of which SARS-CoV is obviously one, and the endemic ones. So you may be aware that we have already four different human coronaviruses that are um, causing infections every year, um, transmitted person to person. These are the so-called endemic coronaviruses. However, they can be traced um, to an evolutionary origin, in some cases to an intermediate host, in others we don't know the intermediate host, but these viruses have been um, known and studied from the 70s or probably before that. Then we have the emerging ones, which are SARS-CoV, the original one, MERS-CoV, and SARS-CoV-2. What I'm showing you here is that in the case of SARS-CoV-2, the genetics analysis tell us that that virus is about 99.6% identical to the virus that was found in the civet cat. So that, um, that uh, animal was undoubtedly the source the zoonotic source for SARS-CoV-2. We still don't know wh what the story is for SARS-CoV-2. And why I'm um, emphasizing that is because you've probably been reading about, well, what is the, the truth here? And the fact is right now, what we know is that there is a coronavirus from the horseshoe bat that's about 96% the same. And there are two uh, different lineages in pangolins, which certainly didn't know this myself, but it is actually a mammal, which it needs to be for purposes of uh, being an animal reservoir um, source of transmission of, the, of this coronavirus. So right now we have a cluster of these viruses that um, we don't really know exactly the connection, what was the intermediate host. So you can see from this too, that it really, um, a virus can have very, very similar genome and yet um, not be able to infect an alternate host. And then a small change can make that possible. 
So that's a little bit about um, the genetics uh, and the epidemiology from the point of view of, of the zoonosis. And I wanted to um, show you this data, again, carrying on the theme of the genetics of this virus. Um, what we know is as the course of the, of the epidemic pandemic has, has been uh, moving along, the virus is undergoing certain changes in the genome. So the nucleotide sequence um, has variations. These are typically not changes that alter the protein that's being encoded by the particular gene of the virus. But these can be tracked now very efficiently with genetic sequencing tools. Um, at the moment, although it's being watched very carefully and we need to be vigilant about this, there really have not been clear associations with any of these genetic differences and whether or not the virus has acquired a greater ability to be transmitted or whether it has acquired the ability to cause more severe disease. So that is important information about where we are now. And I want to just illustrate this for you, if I can show you here, is the evolution of the virus genomes as it's happened since January of 2020 up until this month. And this is a database that's accumulating all of this information. You can see these your orange ones down here. The, um, the process of creating these genetic databases is a process of identifying lineages and those are based on changes that the a virus accumulates as it is being transmitted person to person. So you see, this is where we started with these lineages. Then we began to acquire some other ones. And then more recently, um, the ones in this clade. So these are called clades and these are the different um, lineages of the virus. Um, so um, I, think we can go here to what I want to play for you now to show you how these different um, uh, clades emerged over the course of the pandemic, taking that data set. And I hope you can see that. You can see the orange ones coming, and then you begin to see the, the variations emerging where the, the blue ones and green ones are beginning to appear in different geographic areas. And that is what has been happening over the course of the uh, pandemic. And so we end up with um, a, a change in the distribution of the primary uh, genomes of most of the viruses that are being isolated. You can see we're moving in the direction of the blues. Um, although in uh, many places, uh, there are still mixtures of these different genomes. So that is um, the story of the genetics of all of this. And I will, I hope, go back to my slides. So I want to talk now about the actual interaction between the virus and the host cell. And what we're seeing here, as we've seen many times, I'm sure, the spike protein, which is on red on this, um, this image, attaching to the ACE2 protein, which is blue on the surface of the cell. And what happens after that is what results in the emergence from the cell. This is a scanning EM of many, many hundreds of new viruses. So what happens in between is important because um, it tells us, first of all, where is it possible to think about interfering with this process? And Stephen has told you about remdesivir. So what are the steps in the replication of this virus? We know it attaches, it's an envelope virus. The purpose of the spike protein is to bring together the membrane of the envelope with the, um, with the, uh, um, with the uh, protein that serves as the host cell receptor. So right now uh, we have ACE2 as the primary um, uh, receptor, but there is more information emerging on the subject of receptors for this virus. 
In any case, one point of, of disruption is obviously um, antibodies that will block that fusion protein from doing its function of fusing the virus envelope to the cell en envelope and delivering the virus into the cell. Once that does happen, then what happens is that the RNA from the virus, as we saw, gets released into the cell. The viral proteins that are needed to create the replication complex are made first, and then copies of the RNA are made. Those RNA copies and the proteins that are eventually going to form the new virus come together in the area of the Golgi membranes, and uh, ultimately then the new virus particles are assembled and they come out on the cell surface. The um, remdesivir is a, a drug that interferes with this replication complex. And the other thing that I want to emphasize here, the virus is up against intrinsic host cell defenses, and those are typically the interferon pathway genes that will inhibit viral replication <coughs> at various stages. So <coughs> what about the host response? I, I think that it's very important to understand that there is at this moment no defined correlate of protection against this virus. And <coughs> that is because in effect, the host response to the virus is really has many components. And so this is being studied at Stanford in systems immunology work that's being done by the lab of Bali Palendron and others. But what we are learning is that the virus gets inoculated um, to respiratory tract. It is taken up by the infect by the cell that it targets. And it's also then taken up by dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are the first line of defense against viruses in the sense that they can take up clusters of viruses that are held together by antibodies, and they can also ingest virus-infected cells through phagocytosis. When that happens is when the immune response gets clued in that there is a, um, a problem. And in the context of the dendritic cell, then what happens is the viral proteins are processed in a way that they are then delivered to the surface of the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell then engages with CD8 T cells in this um, section over here. And when that happens, we go from naive to antigen specific CD8 T cells, they can expand clonally, and they can function to clear the virus by creating uh, responses that are both uh, responses that actually destroy the cell, induce apoptosis, um, program cell death of the cell, or by uh, releasing inflammatory mediators into the tissue. Uh, all of that adds up to the CD8 T cell response. CD4 T cells have the same kind of interaction with the dendritic cells in the sense that the antigen of the virus, whatever protein um, has been processed by the dendritic cell is then recognized by a CD4 T cell. We have the population of CD4 T cells undergoing clonal expansion. And those are known for their function as helper cells to uh, induce antibody secreting cells. Those cells also make inflammatory cytokines as well as antibody. So there's this whole constellation of effects that help um, the host control the, um, the process. Now, I think what is one of the most interesting questions, which we do not have an answer, is why are children doing such a better job of controlling this infection? They have all of the same um, equipment, if you will, immunologically, the adults and the children, but the outcomes we know um, very fortunately from pediatrics perspective is very different. And why, as I said, we do not yet know. Um, 
we don't uh, think it's just that they resist infection, I should say. Recent paper that actually just came out um, yesterday, I think, in pediatrics shows that if a child has a household contact, there's about a 30% uh, infection rate, and that is the same as it is for adults in the household. So it's not that they are um, having a differential uh, uh, numbers of infections occurring uh, with exposure. They are simply doing a better job of, um, of handling it. So this is the successful outcome with clearance of the virus. And that is um, the, uh, the goal, if you will, of the uh, immune system. I put a smile here because I thought that person should have been pretty um, cheerful at this point, having, having had an immune system that cleared the virus. So that's the successful outcome. What about the unsuccessful outcome and what's going on there? Just to um, put it schematically and with some pathology uh, slides from lung tissue of fatal cases, the um, point here is that there are multiple virologic and immunologic factors that um, add up to a, a poor outcome. And the first one, which I really want to emphasize because it's an important difference between the original SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV um, is that the ability of this virus to replicate in upper respiratory tract cells is really uh, a big difference. And you can imagine looking here, these are all virus particles coming out of a, a ciliated upper airway cell. Imagine that uh, one cell being several thousands of cells that are infected and producing these viruses. So that is what underlies the transmission um, uh, as far as the difference from our prior, um, our prior um, SARS viruses. The, um, what happens then in the lungs, so here's the ACE receptor, the virus targets pneumocytes. What happens next is that the infected cell may um, trigger what is called um, um, pathogen recognition receptors and create an inflammatory response. This is called inflammasome activation. And that can result in um, activation of antigen presenting cells that instead of doing their job to create the CD4 T cells and the CD8 T cells that have functions to eliminate virus infected cells, instead we see that there is a large um, outpouring of inflammatory cytokines leading to lung injury and, and multi-organ failure. There's also over here, the macrophages, instead of controlling the virus, can actually um, produce um, IL-6. And the result of that is um, increase in number of different cytokines. And so what happens then in the lung is the outcome called diffuse alveolar damage. And that consists at the early stage of hyaline membranes that line the um, alveolar spaces. Um, later, the pneumocytes start to proliferate to try to repair the damage. And in fact, that proliferation of the type two pneumocytes makes worse the, um, the oxygenation uh, uh, problem. Here's just alveolar spaces, again, showing you this is a highly productive infection of these cells and the virions are released into the alveolar spaces and they can go and infect other cells. Another outcome is bronchopneumonia where the neutrophils um, pile up in the alveolar spaces and there's hemorrhage associated. So that is what happens with um, the uh, worst case um, outcome of infection. And I think um, you know, we can, we can uh, understand why it is so difficult to, um, to uh, oxygenate these patients. So this is the last slide I'll have because I wanna be sure we have time for discussion. And here I'll just talk a little bit about the multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. This is a, a syndrome that I'm, I'm sure you're aware has been observed in children 
after there um, has been um, uh, a SARS-CoV-2 infection. In some of these kids, it's not really possible to show that they had SARS-CoV-2, but the timing and the epidemiology is that these cases are showing up about four to six weeks after the local outbreaks have occurred at peak. And there's an estimated now about a thousand cases. The mortality is estimated, and I emphasize um, estimated at 2%, because we really do not have a good denominator and we really need to um, get a much better picture of what's going on in this syndrome. But those are the basic outlines in epidemiology. Most of the kids are between eight and 11. And what happens is an acute inflammatory episode. So we're again, not sure what are the mechanisms of the immunopathology, but again, um, the inflammasome formation of, of the inflammasome due to the recognition by the cell of a foreign um, genome or um, in, invasion happening, all of that resulting in cytokine production listed here, the neutrophils, um, are, are recruited, macrophages, monocytes are recruited, the cytokines themselves create tissue damage much broader than just um, uh, local, let's say, um, lung tissue. Um, and then on the other hand, the adaptive immune system may actually also be contributing to this, um, this uh, outcome. There's a recent paper from um, study of this syndrome and the suggestion is that there's a dysregulation of, cyt of cytotoxic T cells that may be involved here. You've also um, no doubt read about, well, is this similar to Kawasaki or not? This paper um, also, the one that showed the cytotoxic uh, T cell phenomenon, did compare this um, the set of uh, responses in children with MISC, and they have some overlap with Kawasaki's, but definitely different. So it's not a uniform, uh, just the same outcome um, that's been known for many years um, in, in Kawasaki. Treatment um, is largely successful with steroids and immunoglobulin and with supportive care. And so that's, um, that is what I thought um, we could uh, then begin to discuss um, and see if I can. Thank you so much. <clears throat> And for the pathogenesis immune response and just painting the overall picture of SARS-CoV-2 and the different attributes of this particular virus. Um, uh, as Alan mentioned in the, the chat, please go ahead and uh, post your questions. Um, so uh, perhaps we can start with a question about uh, you touched on this a little bit about the difference between SARS-CoV-2 and the prior SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV yes. and the fact that SARS-CoV number one just went away and MERS-CoV kind of occurs sporadically. And is this because of the uh, upper respiratory tract infection? Is that why the transmission has been ongoing and it didn't just disappear? I think that's the best explanation, yes, because, um, and it, however, the mystery of why that, why this version of this virus uh, has such a propensity to infect the upper respiratory cells isn't totally clear. I should mention that just, and this, this story, as we all know, is evolving constantly. Just two days ago in science, there were two new papers which identified yet a different receptor for SARS-CoV-2. And that one is called neurophilin-1. That receptor is on blood vessels and it's on neurons. And so we, we probably have an expanded capacity of this virus uh, in terms of pathogenesis because it has other receptors that it can use in addition to ACE2. 
just building on that before we get to um, uh, other questions, did we have the same sort of age specific pattern with, with the prior coronavirus uh, epidemics? I mean, in, in that kids were so mercifully spared and, and um, you know, more vulnerable adults and, and, and also seemingly obese adults and, and, and maybe patients with diabetes. Yeah. Is, 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 that, is this a familiar pattern? Well, I think, we, thank goodness, there weren't, there weren't many cases. And so in that situation, it was much more straightforward to identify symptomatic patients and isolate them. And so transmission was really nipped in the bud. What I should have mentioned is that we now know that shedding of this uh, SARS-CoV-2 happens before the onset of symptoms. And so the earlier outbreaks um, really were different because it was possible to do containment. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, influenza. Um, actually, one of the, there's a question uh, about that and, and we wanted to talk to you about that as well. Um, lots of comparisons, uh, inappropriate and appropriate ones, pro probably more inappropriate to influenza given that um, this wound up being uh, uh, so much more severe in adults, at least. Um, the, the, a questioner asks if, if it's known if the virus infects thymocytes, as can happen with influenza, uh, or if recent thymic emigrants, I hope you know what that means, because I don't, uh, are more potent against this virus. And, and maybe, you know, you can get granular with that question and also just talk more broadly about um, the virology of, of this as compared to influenza. Well, sure. So let's start with the thymic immigrants. Um, so I think what what we know and what is is not just a SARS-CoV story is that there are a, a number of systemic viral infections that are much worse in adults than they are in children. And I'll just mention chickenpox, my favorite virus. Um, but there are many, and there's the the thymic evolution part of it is. If we talk about kids being kids under 12, that's really where the least severe infections are occurring. The older teenagers are certainly getting sick, not as much as the adults, but what we know about children just globally, their, their um, peripheral blood, as we know, has very high concentrations of lymphocytes. They are walking around with 60% lymphocytes Adults, sadly, uh, we are walking around with 15% lymphocytes. So the um, one observation that has been made is that especially in more in older adults, they don't have very many naive T cells. And whether or not the fact that kids really have just many naive T cells that are ready to take action against this virus may be, as I said, many theories. I like the th that theory, but I have no evidence for it. So I think um, we, we, um, we have this pattern with other viruses and maybe it'll play out having to do with the fact that children have this robust lymphocyte uh, response. Um, the other thing about flu, so I think flu, we have to understand is very different from this virus because with flu, we're used to what we call antigenic drift. So each year, the virus changes a little bit and the immunity that you had from the first or prior infections does provide pr a partial protection. Um, so it's not like a zoonosis where this virus just jumped from the animal host into people and where nobody has um, memory immunity for this virus. So it's the difference between antigenic drift in, and um, the, the zoonosis. The other thing we know about flu is that the first time a child gets flu, they are much more likely to have uh, lung infection. They're much more likely to have a viral pneumonia. So it is, it is really different in that sense. But then from then on out, it's pretty unusual to get lower respiratory tract infection. So that's different. Um, 
and you know, occasionally, obviously, we have pandemic flu, and that can be uh, different. And that, and if you remember the the probably not, but pandemic flu prior pandemic flu episode we had, kids did get quite sick, whereas the the elderly didn't. And that all has to do with the pattern of prior exposure to flu. Now there is data which shows that I showed you those um, common coronaviruses that are circulating. And there is clear data that people have cross-reactive T cells that will that were presumably induced by those infections that will recognize the um, SARS infected cells in, in experimental conditions. That has clearly not made a particular difference in the outcome uh, at the level of our understanding now um, in how people do. So it's, it isn't at all clear that that cross-reactive T cell immunity works. And there's vanishingly little cross-reactive antibody that you would have pre-existing from those, those infections that might help you with an encounter with COVID too. Thank you. So, and there's a question about, if I could summarize this question, um, about the coronary artery dilation that can be seen uh, in Ms. C uh, picture. And if it is different than Kawasaki coronary artery aneurysms, and if if the pathogenesis, for example, is different and if you would manage it differently. Yeah. Um. To my knowledge, it's not different, but the other point I would, would gladly make is we don't have tissue samples from uh, these kids. They are responding to therapy um, by and large. And so I think um, we, we can't know, but I think at the level of what, um, what the radiologists, cardiologists would see, uh, it apparently doesn't look too different. Well, I'll just add to that. One of the yes. tricky things about coronary artery dilation in general is that it fever alone can dilate your coronaries. Uh, and, uh, Jean Newberger's work has, has demonstrated that fairly convincingly. So it's, you know, MISC has been um, such a nonspecific diagnosis to begin with um, that adding, adding the, the nonspecific nature of coronary artery dilation has, has, is yet another challenge with, with making that diagnosis um, and, and knowing how to treat it. But I, I think, yes, most people are treating them very similarly. Um, I, the, um, there's a couple questions. You touched on mutations and, and you just talked about antigenic drift um, with flu. Someone asked, is, is, is there a sense that there will be antigenic drift with SARS-CoV-2? Yeah. Well, we certainly hope it'll settle down in some way and create a much more compatible host virus interaction. What we're used to with hosts and virus interactions is it's all kind of you do this for me and I'll do that for you kind of arrangement. Um, but I don't think we can predict when or even if that's going to happen. Um, the question that we're all worried about and everyone, why I showed you those uh, painfully, maybe those genetic uh, uh, maps as what things, how things are going around the world is because um, we do need to see whether transmission makes the virus more able to transmit. So it is, you know, you can adapt viruses to be uh, able to spread better. And if the virus has many replications in many hundreds of thousands, millions of hosts, there is the possibility that it could actually gain and called gain of function. Um, it's already pretty transmissible, but that is people are watching very carefully and why all these data, data sets, I mean, there are several, at least a hundred plus thousand genomes in the database now and more are being added every day. And that is because we don't know and we need to track what's happening. The other thing that uh, we're thinking about is what happens when you introduce a successful vaccine as we hope we will soon, will that create immune pressure on the virus which would cause it to mutate and evade the immune response that was created 
um, by vaccination. And I, I don't think, think so, but it's something that is going to require constant and ongoing monitoring. Um, along the vaccine, since you brought that up, um, there's a question about whether there should be concern that vaccine could trigger an MISC-like yeah. uh, situation post-vaccination. Well, it hasn't been seen with any other vaccine, and I don't think there's anything special about um, SARS-CoV vaccines that would create that concern. As I showed you, there's not a, a clear mechanism uh, of what triggers the, um, the MISC. Um, it seems to be multifactorial. It doesn't seem to be driven by an antigen specific response, which you would elicit with the vaccine. There isn't evidence for that at this point. Um, yeah, I wanna ask a, a, a broad question that, um, that, that Rajni had, had brought up in earlier discussions, but um, that, that, that as, as someone who has spent their, their career studying viruses, I'd love to hear your take on this, but why is it so hard to mm -hmm. develop drugs that kill viruses? Well, it's what we were just talking about, their ability to mutate. And so as soon as you find a target gene or in a virus um, and you interfere with that, Viruses are really resourceful and they usually have multiple ways of um, doing the same thing. So they have redundancy built into their replication capacity, but they also can mutate, especially as we know, the RNA viruses can mutate very readily. And if your drug is, is targeting a specific sequence uh, or inter, you know, trying to intervene at a certain point, the virus can do a workaround through um, changing that that bit of its um, of its uh, uh, genome, and it'll just do it until it works, if you will. And we know that from um, HIV, of course, all the um, all the problems that have come along with re emergence of resistance. Um, and the other thing is that, as I showed you every virus has this very close interaction with the host cell. And so if you're trying to develop, a, you have to find a target that will interfere with the virus replication, but the virus is using all of our normal cell machinery to do what it's doing. And so you have a challenge to find a drug that won't disrupt the cell functions. So it's a really, it's a combination. I, I think those are two key points to make. Combination of virus mutation and the fact that the takeover of the cell by the virus um, is limits what you can actually do because you cause toxicity. I think building on that as well, um, many a time, the virus has already established itself before we even pick the antiviral and try to treat. And is it the timing of it? Um, and I, I would also like to ask, uh, since we were talking about herpes virus just before we yeah. went on the webinar, uh, even disseminated HSV, we can somehow deal with the virus. So is it because it's a DNA versus RNA virus? And if you could comment on that. Well, it, it's because we have a cyclovir and related drugs that um, target a gene that is only present in the virus. The host cell does not have the target, um, the thymidine kinase or polymerase target. It's virus specific um, target. And of course, we do see emergence of resistance. If you give a cyclovir low dose long enough, you can get emergence of resistance. But it is also true, your point, that the RNA viruses, um, they are much quicker at um, creating alternative genomes. Um, the questioner asked you to, to, to um, elaborate a little bit on uh, the question about nucleoside analogs and whether analogs also get incorporated into normal host cells. Uh, typically, no. 
Um, and there's a question about timing of this virus, and I am unfamiliar with this particular report, but uh, the uh, question is, there's a report in Lancet of SARS-CoV-2 in archival sewage samples from Barcelona in spring of 2019. Uh, so the question is, is, was this truly, was there an emergence in Wuhan? What are your thoughts? Well, I missed that paper. <laughs> there's such an onslaught of papers. I know we're all being uh, submerged by the publications. I did not know that. I think we have to be careful because um, that was undoubtedly relying on PCR to uh, detect genome and whether you've got a clean enough PCR assay. And I'm sure they did it with controls and so on, but PCR assays are prone to false positives. We know that. That's one thing. Um, and I'm, I would doubt they were able to culture the virus from those samples. And that would be what it would take to really prove it. I think that um, we, we have enough tracking uh, of genomes um, that we can uh, be pretty confident that it was newly emerging in um, uh, late uh, 2019. But we have many lessons to learn, um, which is gonna take a long time. Um, to really sort through what what happened and what is happening. Can, can we go back to the uh, ACE2 receptor? You, you talked about that in, in your slide. And, and, you know, I think that of, of all of the explanations that have been given so far as to why kids might fare better, um, sort of low expression of that receptor um, is as good as, as any other uh, explanation given. And at least there's been some data to support that. Is it, did you, as a virologist, did, did it, was this receptor on your radar? Is this something that we've seen as a, as a receptor yeah. in other viruses? And, and I guess, it ha is, is it a potential drug target? We heard a lot early on that maybe ACE inhibitors were good and then maybe that they were bad. And now um, we don't really know, but tell us about this receptor a little bit. Well, so it was um, suspected right away because it is the receptor for the original SARS-CoV. And so it's not for MERS, but it is for SARS-CoV. And so that, um, that was uh, understood very quickly. And um, as far as targeting that um, interaction, I think um, most people would say is best targeted by antibodies. Now, whether or not there can be a specific antiviral, there's certainly uh, effort to try and figure out how to target. Target the fusion process, I should say, not just the protein, because it's really the function of the protein. And we do know that this protein has to be cleaved in order to become activated and cause that um, uh, fusion of the virus envelope with the host cell envelope. So there is known um, a furin cleavage event that, that has to happen so that the, the S protein actually has um, subunits and those have their own functions. And so in, in the process of targeting the whole event of fusion, it may be, uh, it may be feasible. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a question about uh, regarding the virus life cycle and release from host cell. Does mm -hmm. this occur by continuous budding? Does this kill the host cell? Yeah. It definitely kills the host cell. I, I think that um, it does. There's a phase of, of budding like I saw I showed in that uh, that scanning EM, although this host cell looked kind of uh, sickly at that point. So it's not going to not going to survive um, being taken over by the virus. Well, I, I want to close um, with a, a bigger picture question uh, about transmission um, and, you know, whether everything we've just talked about in terms of pathogenesis um, 
influences your thought on, you know, what, what I think is still some uncertainty over the extent to which that this may be droplet versus aerosol spread and any closing thoughts in, in the last minute on that? That's a tough one. What I would say is that there is good evidence of masks working and masks, um, masks particularly as source control. So if somebody is infected and you're blocking those creation of any aerosol that, that gets distributed um, to the best extent possible. Um, but I don't think we know uh, at the virologic level, what exactly um, is required for an event of transmission, other than we can look at those pictures of how many virions are in those are being released from those upper respiratory cells, and we know that they're present in high titers in um, uh, secretions. But beyond that, I don't think we can quite model what actually happens in people. And so I'd say uh, unanswered questions there. Can, can we can we trust that Dr. Maldonado will answer it in two weeks? I am certainly willing to say, sure, she will. <laughs> <laughs> she'll be very mad at me, but she will certainly talk about all of that, I'm sure. Well, great. Well, listen, um, thank you so much. What an instructive hour. Uh, lots of good questions. Thanks to our audience for those. And I look forward to seeing everyone next week. Well, thanks um, really from me to all of you that are on the front lines there with this, uh, this dreadful uh, pandemic. Many thanks. Thank you all. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.